I think the thing that's important here is that when you go through different situations, uh, there's usually a lesson you're supposed to learn. And you have to understand any challenge you're facing, it's a lesson. It's an opportunity for you to grow. And when you're facing things that are really hard, just ask yourself, what's the lesson I'm supposed to take away from this? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Journey to Multifamily Millions. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Zana Investments, Tim Little. And on today's show, we have with us John Kasman. John is the founder of Kasman Capital, a real estate investment firm. He's a coach for multifamily syndicators like myself, co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit, and is it as if he wasn't busy enough, host of the top-rated podcast, Multifamily Insights. John, welcome to the show. Hey, Tim, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here and lots of good stuff to talk about. So let's jump into it. Yeah, and it is great to have you. So I gave everyone a high level overview of your background. But on this show, we really like to get into the details of how you got started on your journey. So please take us back to the beginning and tell us how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I'll try to compress this timeline a little bit, but I really start off in corporate America like a lot of the listeners. I was working in advertising and marketing. I was working at General Motors at one point, and I was there back in 2007 through 2011. And if you remember that time frame, 2008, 2009 is when the company went into bankruptcy. I was there that entire time, and I watched the anxiety that I know I had, my, my colleagues had. I watched people who were lifers, people who had dedicated their entire careers to this company, to this industry, who were being let go, and they didn't have a plan B. And that really made me reconsider my approach, and it, uh, it made me think about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I know you've got right behind you. And that just really pushed me to say, you know what, I need to take more control of my financial future. And real estate was the thing that would help me do that. So I knew it was going to be real estate. I just didn't know how to do real estate. <laughs> so you fast forward a couple of years, I moved to Chicago. And one of the first things we wanted to do was start learning about the different markets, the different neighborhoods. And uh, I found this neighborhood called North Center. My wife and I bought a two unit building there. We did what we call a house hack, lived in one unit, rented out the other unit, saved up our money. A couple of years later, we bought another property, a three unit, this time in Avondale. That did really well. That was a pure rental. Saved up money, actually refinanced that first property, bought an eight unit. This is our first commercial property. Now we've got a property management company in place, so I'm managing the manager. And at this moment, I know that this is working and this is the path forward, but I'm running into a a little bit of a brick wall because we have to wait until we save enough money to buy a property. And at that time, the company I was with was actually facing more financial issues. So I went from being at GM, big, huge company that ends up going bankrupt to work for a much smaller advertising agency, doing great work, but also is a technically closing shop. So at that time, I was just like, we got into real estate to take more control of my future. Yet, I'm still in the same situation. I've got equity in these deals, which is great, but not enough cash flow to replace my W-2. And that just made me start thinking about other approaches and, and working with OPM, other people's money, became a real solution. Not just because it helped me, but as I was building my portfolio, my friends, they would ask, oh, man, that's great. You bought that. How'd you do it? And I would tell them and I would think try to get them to do the same thing. And they wouldn't. And I realized that maybe if... If I could find the opportunities, maybe they would be willing to partner with me instead of trying to do it by themselves. Because I had invested years and years at this point of educating myself, and it wouldn't be fair for them to, to just go out there and have the same level of confidence that I had. So that led me down the path of apartment syndication, right? And fast forward today, we've invested over $125 million worth of apartments, working with everyday professionals, just like you and I, who are trying to just take care of their family and do what's right and find good investment opportunities. Yeah, it's such an awesome story. And I, I think uh, it's a story that I hear a lot with a lot of different syndicators. So starting with that shaking of security that comes from seeing mass layoffs and stuff like that. A similar thing in my own experience where my wife had worked at a company for nine years, which nowadays is unprecedented, <laughs> right? When, when, when people move companies for every one or two years, as she does now. 
But at the time, it was just one of those things where they did a merger, right? And then positions become redundant, etc. no fault of her own. And she found herself without a job. And we were okay. We were, we got used to a dual income, right? And so you get used to certain amount of money coming in. And so it's just a shock to the system yeah. and a shock to that sense of security that you have when that entire income disappears overnight. So I, I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. And that was one of the pushes that we need, but it sounds like in your case, that was the, the impetus to, to get you into investing and find another stream of cash flow. Is that right? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think the thing that's important here is that when you go through different situations, uh, there's usually a lesson you're supposed to learn. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand any challenge you're facing, it's a lesson. It's an opportunity for you to grow. And when you're facing things that are really hard, just ask yourself, what's the lesson I'm supposed to take away from this? And in that situation, the, the one beautiful thing, and again, hindsight's twenty twenty, but the beautiful thing is, I had a lot of time to think about this. It wasn't like I woke up one day, the company went bankrupt, and I was like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? Let me scramble, go get another job. It was almost a year. It was like from March or April until we didn't formally go into bankruptcy until a year later. So it was every day this anxiety of what's going on, right? We had the election take place. We had the car czar that came through. We had all of this stuff that was happening, and every day I had to think about my future. I applied at different companies. I had a job offer at another really nice company, Domino's actually. We, it just didn't work out with the, the compensation and stuff like that. So I thought about all this stuff, so I had a lot of time. And because I had a lot of time, I could really look at all of the options. And if I was compressed, if it was a situation where I got let go and oh my goodness, how am I gonna pay my bills next month? I would have had to just apply, get a job and keep it moving. But because I had time, I could say, okay, yes, I could go get another job. But what happens if, you know, that company's not doing well? So I, I had a chance to process all of this. And ultimately, my conclusion was you need to take more control of your future. And, and real estate became that outlet. The irony is I, I worked for two companies that went bankrupt, but I never missed a paycheck. I never missed a paycheck. So both companies took care of me. GM obviously restructured. And then that agency, it rebooted as a new agency. And the owners actually paid us out of their pocket to make sure we continue to work while they were going through that restructure. So I've been very fortunate from that standpoint, but I will say that sometimes you need that kick to get going. And if I can say one thing, because we've been talking about the financial aspect of it, there's also that time freedom and that location independence that comes with corporate America as well. And the best example I could give you is my boss's boss when I was at GM. She moved from San Francisco, right? So she was like the regional manager of San Francisco, moved to Detroit headquarters to take on this company or take on our team and lead that. And she is expected to get promoted at a high level. And once we got through bankruptcy, whoever that, that person they put in place, they just didn't mesh very well. So they actually shipped her to Shanghai. So within about a three-year time frame, this woman relocated from California to Detroit, Michigan, to Shanghai. And that's the thing you understand. She Financially, she was fine. She was making great money, but she didn't have control over where she lived, her family. She had a kid in high school. And I just started to process all that. Like, man, yes, I could stay here and rise up the ranks and be a director and make a lot of money. But if I can't even dictate where I live, if, if that's par for the course to really make it in this company, that's not what I want. And that really made me rethink that approach and, again, get more control over my future. Yeah, and, and you hit on something that I, I think is important for a lot of people to hear, especially if they're considering pursuing multifamily full-time, right? Because a lot of people, there's a divide, I, I think, in this industry. <laughs> there's the people who say what you did, which is be very intentional yeah. ab about what you're doing and create a plan and keep that income coming in as long as you can before you cut it off and pursue that entrepreneur endeavor. And then there's the other people who say, burn the boats, because if you're in panic mode, you'll find a way to make it happen. <laughs> and I am on the former. I prefer to, to lay out a plan and be very intentional about how I'm going to do that. And that's exactly what happened in my case. 
I was on military orders. So I had a decent paycheck coming in. And then it, that discussion that I had with my wife when she got laid off was, hey, why don't you go to grad school right now? Because it's something you wanted to do. Get your MBA. I'll, I'll hold it down while you're going to grad school full time. Just get it knocked out. And then after that, what I'd like to do is start doing real estate full time because I was going to have to come off orders anyways. We had two years for me to save up money, to create a plan, to lay the groundwork for that business before I ever started doing it full time. So I think that intentionality can make a big difference both in your peace of mind as well as potentially your success in the business itself. I think it also comes down to personality, right? You got to know yourself. Sure. Are, are you someone who can burn the boats and be good with it? Are you a, hey, I'm a, I am grabbed a backpack and I'm just traveling across America kind of person? Or are you someone who needs to have things meticulously laid out? Well, you, if you come from corporate America, that is structure. It is very hard to go from a structured environment for you, military, for me, General Motors, big corporations. It is hard to go from that to just free nilly willy. And let's just see what happens today, right? You want to have a plan. You're used to having that. You're used to managing teams. You're used to understanding what is our objective? What are we trying to get accomplished? What is the best path forward? What are our options? I want to evaluate the options. I want to understand the risk involved in these options. That can hurt you as an entrepreneur because you may overthink different mm -hmm. things, right? Overthink different options. And some people, they just run. If something's working, great, let's keep doing it. If it's not, let's just pivot. So I think some of that comes down to personality. But what I will say is that it is it can be very dangerous for some people to just burn the bridges and go. Because, yes, you can figure a way out, but it may not be either the best way. You may waste a lot of time. You may waste a lot of money. You may make a lot of mistakes. So I would say what you really would want to do is start identifying success stories find a mentor, find a path, find a blueprint, and then understand who you are, what your strengths are, understand where you have weaknesses, understand where you may face challenges, and do everything you can to position yourself to see success. And then, at, yes, at some point, you've got to make a decision to go all in. You've got to make a decision to say, I'm going to commit to this. And I think that's really the point people are trying to get at is the commitment. Because if you have a cushy day job, Maybe you're not willing to put in the hours necessary to underwrite one more deal or to make one more phone call or to talk to one more broker because you're tired or you got other things to do or whatever the case may be. Uh, but if you don't have that, maybe you are willing. The, the challenge on that side is you may not have the knowledge or the resources or the team or the credibility to pull that off anyway. So I would say there's a fine balance, but there does need to be a level of commitment if you are going to see success. Yeah, and those are all fair points. Um, I think another important point that, you know, came out in your story, because we have people in different stages, right, who listen to the show. Some folks may be very experienced syndicators, but you may have those folks who are listening, trying to understand it and don't know how to get started, like what that first step is. And hearing your story, it sounds like you took those what I like to call baby steps and, and not in a disparaging way, but the steps in complexity moving up from house hacking to buying a separate intentional investment property and then hitting that, that brick wall of capital and then figuring out what is the solution to this problem? Okay, using other people's money and then moving into syndication. And so I think there's different people on different sides say, some say that's the best way. And maybe this comes down to personality again, like you talked about, whereas others would argue, hey, just go big on your first deal and do a, a hundred unit syndication. Well, a lot of people, if they don't fully understand it yet, are very intimidated by that idea, even though much of it is an idea, some of the processes and stuff are still the same. So maybe that isn't the best step for them. Maybe they need to take those smaller steps first in order to gain that confidence to move on to the next step. So as a coach, I'd like to get your perspective uh, on that divide as well. Yeah, that's a great question, great points that you bring up there, right? And I, I tell people all the time that if you are looking to scale your portfolio, if you're looking to attract capital for deals, you have to follow the three C's, right? 
First C is confidence. Second C is credibility. And the third C is connections. And in this case, what you're getting at is the confidence to scale and to go big. For me, that confidence came from both my corporate background as well as being able to do some of those smaller deals, right? Being able to do that two unit, having success with it, having that three unit be successful, having the eight unit not be as successful as it could have been, but for me to learn and to know what I would have done differently. And that was key to have a little bit of, I don't want to call it failure because it wasn't a failure, but a little bit of resistance because with the first two deals, I knew I wasn't that good, right? <laughs> like it wasn't like, oh man, everything I touched is, I knew I did a good job analyzing, analyzing the deals. I knew I did a good job selecting the markets. I knew I did a good job operating and handling or leasing and all that kind of stuff. But as a newbie, I also knew that there were things I didn't know, but I, and I wasn't getting, I wasn't facing any pushback. So I couldn't really learn and grow. And you need that to grow. You have to have some adversity so you can actually learn what you have to improve upon. And that eight unit gave me that. And it that actually helped me build more, my confidence, even more the successful deals that I did. Because now I'm sitting there and I'm talking to a third-party property management company that manages hundreds of units. And I've got a different opinion. And I was right. So now I believe in what I'm saying because I'm seeing it doesn't matter that these people have 500 units that they manage. I'm telling you what I see. I'm looking at these numbers. I'm talking to the residents. I'm going to the property. And now I can believe in what I see because I'm getting feedback from the marketplace and not just on a two unit or a three unit. And I'm not saying an eight unit is a huge deal. But for me, it was being able to sit down with the head of that property management company to sit and have lunch and to talk strategically about what's happening at the property. What does he see in the market? Having that match what I'm seeing, that really gave me the confidence to go up and scale much larger. I would say, too, what's critical for you to scale is both education, but also who you surround yourself with in your network. And one thing that I started to do really early on was I attended a lot of networking events, but the people who would go frequently were, were typically the people who hosted it. The person who hosts the event is usually showing up every month, and I was showing up every month. So I got to know these people fairly well. And as you watch what they're doing in their business, and you're talking to them about how they're scaling and what they're doing and what are they seeing in the marketplace, that's going to allow you to build your confidence. So by building your network with these individuals, that helps you build your confidence, that helps you talk to people, but also helps you get real clues on how to succeed. And the thing that I took away was you need, I needed to have people in my circle who I could trust and depend upon, and that meant getting a mentor. The second thing that I admit was I needed to learn how to learn, meaning I knew what I knew, but I still knew there were things I didn't know. And I needed to be resourceful to figure out how to find that information when I came across it. Because if you don't figure that out, if you hit that brick wall, you're going to feel stuck. And once I got to the point where I had my mentor, it actually empowered me because I knew if I hit a wall, I'm just going to turn around and say, hey, man, I hit this wall. How do I get over this? And he's going to tell me how to get over the wall, right? And now I'm good. Or I'm going to reach out to someone else who I know has faced the same challenge. And now I'm empowered to make mistakes. And now I feel good about scaling. Now I feel good about raising capital because I'm talking to people in my circle who have done it. And they're guiding me through this process. So that helped me really grow and scale. And as a coach, that's what I would tell my clients to tell anyone else is surround yourself with people who can empower you, who can help you grow, who can help you scale. And then those concerns and those fears, they get alleviated because you have real solutions and answers in place. Yeah, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Surrounding yourself with the people who are one, two, three steps ahead of you so that you're one learning by osmosis, right? Just by being around them. But at some point, some of these folks may invite you onto a deal because you've shown the whatever value that you can bring to it. And then once, once you're in that place and you find people that you like to deal with, you interact well with, then those might form those partnerships that last one deal, two deals, three deals. And that's what really gets your momentum going when you find the people that, that you like to partner with, but almost more importantly, the more experienced people that want to partner with you. Yeah, you're All spot right. on, man. Those relationships are absolutely key, and that's how you grow and scale. Yeah, and picking up on one of the, the three C's that, that you talked about earlier, 
credibility. So I wanted to talk about that because you are a big advocate for syndicators having a strong personal brand, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, do you credit your time in marketing uh, in advertising for understanding the importance of branding? And what have, what steps have you personally taken to, to grow your own brand? That's a great question. I do give a, a fair amount of credit to my time in advertising and marketing. And I would say <clears throat> there's, I think there's a big misperception on uh, what we mean when we say branding and personal brand, right? Because that sounds, oh, I got to go out there and launch a podcast or I got to go out there and write a whole bunch of social media posts. And the reality is everyone has a personal brand, right? The, the only question is what are you doing to influence what your personal brand is or what people think of you or what they know about you or what they say about you? If I was still in advertising and marketing, that's all people would know about me. But – Yes, I'm a multifamily investor, but if that's not what you know me as, that's not really a part of the personal brand that I'm, I'm projecting, right? There are other things that I may be interested in, but if people don't know about that or they don't think about before that, it's not a part of my personal brand. I'll give you a great example. Let's say, let's say I was an attorney. If you are an attorney, you probably have no problem telling people you're an attorney. They would know you as the attorney. And there are certain things that come with being an attorney, right? They're going to think that you're pretty intelligent, that you understand the law, that you probably make good money, right? There's going to be per certain perceptions people have just on that title, right? So certain titles have a, a bit of a personal branding that, that comes with it. But who you are personality-wise also comes through. So I'll use uh, my sister. She's a real estate agent. And one of the things that she's really good at is being very thoughtful. She doesn't just get you to the closing table. She wants to help you set up your new home. And not just me, but she did it with a lot of her clients. She'll go in and she'll say, you need a handyman. Here's this handyman. Here's this carpet cleaning company. Here's this moving company. Here's my electrician guy, right? Go to this place and they'll get you set up with XYZ. Here's my house cleaning crew. So she's trying to make sure you have everything that you need to move in. So when people think of her, they can go to any real estate agent, right? And she also is focused on one specific city, right, or suburb. It, that's what she's known for. If you go on Zillow, she's a top listed agent there. That's what she focuses on, right? So she has built a personal brand as the number one agent in that suburb. And part of it is because of her care, her commitment to helping you move into the home. Those are the things that she does. But she didn't walk around with a billboard saying, hey, I'm the number one agent in this suburb and I'm going to take. No, that's just the vibe she's got. When people talk about her, when you ask for a referral, you ask for a reference. These are the things people are going to tell you. So that's what we mean with a personal brand. It's really just taking a megaphone to who you are. It's a megaphone to what you do, who you are. And that's what you're developing with a personal brand. You cannot just try to convey something that you're not. And I think that's the mistake people make is they may want to, say, attract doctors. Hey, I want to get a bunch of doctors for investors. Okay, great. What connection do you have to doctors? None. Okay, why would a doctor want to invest with you? Like, you have to really step back and say, okay, what is, who am I? How do I convey the best parts of me to other people so that they can get to know me and decide whether or not they want to do business with me. It's just like a shoe. I'll take, I used to work on the Nike brand. Nike built a personal brand by one, developing a quality shoe, but then two, putting it on the best athletes in the world. That's how they position themselves as a world-class brand. You have a shoe that is a, a competitor, but no one's ever heard of it. People are going to be very hesitant to work on that or to, to buy that brand because they don't know what it can do. So you have to build that. But just because Nike's built a reputation for one thing doesn't mean that it translates into something else. If they came out with cars, I'm not trying to buy a Nike car. Like, I don't know what they know about automotive engineering or developing safety features and things like that. So it just doesn't translate everywhere, right? So when you're building your personal brand, what you're trying to do is figure out what do you want to be known for and then sharing that you are knowledgeable, personable, you're someone that people can trust in that space. And for syndicators, I think it's very important if you're raising money for deals because people have to know and trust you if they're going to invest with you. And typically we're talking about larger investments and larger commitments. So if someone's going to invest the kind of capital with you, they're going to need to know that you're somebody they can believe in. Yeah. And, and you hit that one point at the end that I was going to touch on, which is the no and trust piece. A lot, they may know a lot of people and they may have an extensive network, but as soon as they shift to becoming 
with Syndicator and attempting to raise money, it, you want to get rid of the confusion there, right? Like you don't want to be that guy like Tim, the army guy. And he calls up someone and says, Hey, would you like to invest a hundred thousand dollars in this deal? And they're like, what are you talking about? Right. Like you're an army guy. And so you have to, I, I hate to say rebrand yourself because you're not changing who you are. You're just letting people know that you've moved into this different field, that you have credibility, expertise, experience, because otherwise it doesn't really matter how big your network is. If they don't know what you do, then they have no reason to view you as an expert in that field. Yeah, you're spot on. And I would say too, part of, I think one of the best strategies you can employ is to expand what people already know you for. So in my case, yeah. being in corporate America, what are people going to give me credit for? They're going to be, you, you did it at the beginning of the show, right? You gave me credit for doing marketing and advertising. You gave me credit for working on large brands, working on huge budgets, working on big campaigns. So I do a thing or two about business, right? Business marketing in particular. So when I when it comes to getting into real estate, Maybe I don't know as much about construction or maybe you're not going to give me as much credit for that. But when it comes to project management or, or leadership and being able to put teams together, people give me, they'll give me credit for that. When it comes to investor relations or account management and working with people, having interpersonal skills, those are things that are transferable, right? Those are skills that I can bring from my corporate time into this new role. Same with you, right? Being in the army, being in the military, people are going to expect you to be somebody who's trustworthy. They're going to expect you to be somebody who is dependable, somebody who is organized, someone who can run a project, someone who can lead a team. So those things are transferable skills in business in general. If you come from a different world, again, what are people giving you credit for based on what they've seen from you, what they know from you? Leverage that into the new field you're going to do. If I could give you another example in the entertainment space, you could take someone like Jennifer Lopez, and I don't care what you think of Jennifer Lopez, but this is someone who was one of the first people in a long time who established himself as one thing and then expanded to being a singer, then expanded to being an actress, right? Expanded to being a dancer. And now this is a person who gets a lot of credit. Take the Apple brand, right? Apple was computers for so long, period. They were computers. Then they came out with the iPod. And people gave them credit because it was still technology, right? It was music, but it was still technology. Then they went from the iPod to the the iPhone. And that was a pretty big stretch for people. Well, you're making phones now? That's like Nokia space. But it was still technology. So they gave them credit for being able to take that technology and being able to simplify that and leveraging their design expertise. So now anything electronic that... Apple makes, most people would give them credit for it. They came out with watches, right? If you would have went back when they were doing MacBooks and you're telling me they would have came out with a watch, people would be like, that makes absolutely no sense. But you get credit for the things you can do. So as investors, I would say lead into the things that you're already known for as you're expanding into this new space so that people can look at it and say, that makes sense. If you're an investor, if you make wise business decisions, if you are very personal or know how to take care of, people are going to give you credit for those things. So lead into that and just expand your brand in that space. Yeah, one of my favorite examples that uh, I was talking to my wife about today is Ryan Reynolds, right? People used to just laugh him off. Oh, he played Deadpool. Yeah, he's a funny guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he bought Mint Mobile <clears throat> and everyone's like, wait, why is he buying, you know, <laughs> a phone company? That makes no sense. All of a sudden you see Ryan Reynolds on every one of their commercials because what was he doing? He was leveraging his own personal brand to increase the value of that company. And he did buy a lot. And oh, by the way, you know, he had like, it was, I don't know, 20, 40% stake in the company. And then turns around a couple of years later and sells it for more than a billion dollars. So jokes on everybody else when he walked away with, it was something like six or $700 million just from that one deal. So I don't think anyone is laughing now in terms of him being a savvy businessman. He has Aviation Gin and, and a couple of the soccer team and all this stuff. And people are like, okay, he's for real now. They have to respect that once they see the results of his actions. Yeah. And listen, we could take that concept to another level too, right? And, and it goes into celebrity. And this is where it gets a little dicey. But there is power in building a network and building a following. And the best example of that is Kylie Jenner. This is probably what the one of the, the Kardashians that people do the least about. But she became a billionaire off of Kylie Cosmetics. And a lot of that was because she was able to leverage her following and her audience 
into something that she could monetize and something that they gave her credit for, right? Cosmetic, beauty, makeup made sense for people to say, okay, hey, let's use the makeup she uses. So that's the thing. There's power in building a brand. Whether or not you want to do that and put yourself out there and amass a following, that's a decision for you. But what you're talking about with Ryan Reynolds, with Kylie, with a lot of these celebrities, they recognize that because they have fame and awareness, they can monetize that by showing people other things that they may be interested in. Now, the risk is when you're validating these things, People are still going to scrutinize them. If Nike goes out there um, and people go out there and buy that shoe and it's terrible and they all break their ankles and stuff, Jordan's credibility is shot, right? If you see someone endorse a product that it's a terrible product, they don't believe it. They don't believe in that person's ability as a spokesperson because they're like, oh, you're just doing it for a check. As syndicators and as investors and anyone trying to build a brand, that is something you've got to protect because you don't want to just go out there and rubber stamp everything. You have to make sure you're taking your time, doing your due diligence, and then building that trust with your audience. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's, there's certainly a risk involved. Now, I want to go into the coaching aspect of what you do because we are at a, a very different time now in multifamily than we were, say, one or two years ago, right? If, if you got in two years ago, you probably look like a genius on those, those first few deals. Now, it's f being much harder to, one, find deals and, two, fund them and just to have them pencil out, right, because of the increased rates that drives down cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. Are you taking a, a different approach and setting expectations differently for your coaching students in this environment compared to, say, how you did two years ago, for example? So our approach is it as different because we always focus on the fundamentals and the fundamentals are cash flow first appreciation second and what that means is you're looking for deals that provide quality cash flow where you can stay in the deal as long as possible or as long as you want to and i think where a lot of people have gotten tripped up or are, are facing challenges now is focusing on that three-year exit right we're going to buy this property we're going to do x on z to it we're going to sell it in three years and we're going to sell it at a four cap on the exit if you buy a property and it cash flows, you get to decide will you sell as long as you have, as long as you have a loan that provides that flexibility. So from a coaching standpoint, we never really wavered on that. I think certainly you want to have some flexibility and some deals you may put bridge financing on or you may have a different business plan. But I think you really want to make sure that there's a value, a strong value add component to do a deal like that. I do think it's very important for everyone to be cautious. So one thing we're telling all of our clients right now and all of our students is pay attention to the numbers, pay attention to those big ticket items that tend to go up. Those are taxes. Those are insurance. These line items can really crush deals, but also make sure you're looking at the deal with a long-term view. Don't expect to be in and out of this deal in 24 months. Expect to be in a deal five years minimal, but maybe even six, seven, eight years. And make sure you're doing deals where you're comfortable being in it seven years. Because if it's something that is, let's say it's a much older product and that stuff is going to break down in year three, that may not be the kind of thing you want to be in if you're going to have a big ticket expense three, four years in ownership. Uh, I would rather buy something and have a plan to take care of those larger ticket items or give myself some flexibility to either refinance or exit. So all of that's really important. So you definitely want to be more conservative. But I would say we, we can always have taken that approach. So I don't think it's changed too drastically. All right. No, that makes sense. And, and I think the key word that you said there, for me at least, was flexibility, right? Yeah, you may be able to sell in year five, but if you have that loan out to year seven, it provides that flexibility so that you can assess the market. You know, maybe this is the right time, maybe it isn't. You can hold it for that extra year to wait for the dust to settle to a point where you will be more profitable. And that flexibility goes a long way. This has been some awesome insights, John. I really appreciate it. Now we are going to transition into the turbo round. So I'm going to ask you three questions that I ask every guest. And I just ask for some quick, honest answers. All right. First one. What is one red flag that every investor should look out for? Ooh, in a deal or an operator or what? It, it could be either or. I would say declining demand. And I'm saying demand because that could be a reflection of population. It could be a reflection of rich dropping. But you want to look out for any deal 
where demand is decreasing because that's going to be a red flag for your business plan. Okay, yeah. So within that market is rental demand decreasing. Yep. All right, makes sense. Next one, what is a myth about this business that you would like to set straight? That you have to have a very boisterous, over-the-top personality to raise capital. I know there are a lot of calm, cool, demeanor people who are very successful. What it really takes is honesty, transparency, and the ability to talk to people. You don't have to be a caricature or somebody who's over the top. You just have to be willing to help people. And if you're willing to do that, you're willing to learn and build relationships, you can be successful. Yeah, and that's not something that I've heard on the show before, but I think it's a really important point that some people need to hear, right? Those natural introverts. I know you claim to be an introvert yourself at times, but you're right. If you're out there to help people, you'll find a way to do it that's in line with your personality, your skills, your traits, etc. All right, John, last question. What does success look like to you? Man, I love this question. So for me, around the time when I was in corporate America, I really started to think about success. And that, that actually is one of the things that helped lead me into real estate. Because when I looked up at that senior leadership position, I didn't see many of them being happy. And being happy to me was really important. And we're all chasing happiness, right? But the one thing I realized is that it, it wasn't going to be defined by a, a monetary figure. It was going to be the ability I had to control my life. And the best way I described that was time flexibility time freedom to be involved with my kids and be a present father for me success is being able to be present with my kids being able to coach them in some of the activities that they do being able to stop my day when they come home from school and and work with them and check out what's going on and being involved with them that to me is success but really it comes down to being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it with who you want to do it with right and work i I enjoy work i don't ever want to stop working i I don't work crazy hard all the time but i hope i'm working until i I die i just want it to be wherever i want to be and with whoever i want it to be with on my own terms so to me that is success yeah i love that and you're so right because that time we have with our kids as children is so fleeting And sometimes we forget that. So I think it's really important to to key in on that fact. Hey, John, I've had a lot of fun and you've dropped a ton of knowledge on the show. Please tell our listeners how they can get a hold of you and if there's anything else that you'd like to share with them. Yeah, Tim, I appreciate it. Listen, we've got a show as well called Multifamily Insights. So if you enjoy podcasts like this, check out Multifamily Insights wherever you listen to podcasts. And then we have a, a treat on our website. It's a sample deal package. It's completely free, no cost to you. But what it does, it gives you a sense of what to look for in a deal package. So if you're an active investor looking to do your first syndication, you can get a sense of what an outline should look like, what kind of information should you include. And if you're looking to invest maybe passively to start off, Maybe you want to understand what kind of questions you should be asking or what should you be looking for in a deal structure. So go ahead and check that out. It's uh, at kasmincapital.com slash sample deal. All right. Awesome. We will certainly have all that information in the show notes. John, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate you and look forward to continuing to see you do big things on your journey to multifamily millions. Thanks for having me too.